Hello and welcome to World Inside on Tianwei in Beijing. We begin with a surge in anti-Asian hate in the United States. Last week, a mass shooting in Georgia, in which six of the eight fatalities are Asian American women, sounded the alarm over racist crimes. The group Stop AAPI Hate revealed last week nearly 3,800 incidents reported over roughly a year amid the pandemic. Also in the summer of 2020, the Stop AAPI Hate Youth Campaign interviewed 990 young Asian American adults across the U.S. about their experiences during the pandemic and found that one in four reported experiencing racism in some way. Children said they were bullied, physically harassed, and took the brunt of racial slurs. So what's fueling the surge in hate crimes and how can Asian Americans word up the racist attacks? Let's loop in our panelists. They have certainly very different views. For anti-Asian hate crimes in Washington, D.C., Jean Felser, professor of English and Asian studies from University of Delaware, and William Lee, chief economist with the Milken Institute, also, in Beijing, we have Professor Teng Jimeng, freelance movie critic and cultural commentator. He's also working as a professor in China's Foreign Language University. What a pleasure to welcome all of you. Professor Felder, not being an Asian American, <laughs> looking from outside, but looking at your country, what is going on with this hate crime that seems to be caught everybody's attention? I think the hate crime is part of a package of what's happening in my country and happening globally. It starts, of course, with the anti-immigrant sentiment that arose so powerfully in the, during the last administration, the closing of the border. I think the issue of COVID is very critical to the violence that's happening now and Chinese people being targeted for causing COVID, for bringing COVID to the world, mm. which just doesn't, isn't supported by the science. I think it's a perfect storm that it's fed into a lot of stereotypes and images of Chinese people, mm -hmm. particularly mm -hmm. Chinese women being set up and seen as vulnerable, as passive and diseased. So. Mm. All of this is coming together with a rise in gun violence yes. in the United yes. States. So it's a perfect storm that is coming down on elderly Asians, Asian students, my students, and people, you know, Asian people across the country. I see. Uh, Mr. Lee, the Asians now these days are much more vocal than they used to be there on the streets. They're demonstrating against the hate crime. They're letting everybody know about what's going on. Um, but how much uh, will they be able to, you know, uh, prevent further tragedies from happening? We don't know, do we? What is the real problem well, here? I think that the fact that the Asian Americans are speaking up uh, means that we are truly American. We feel we have rights. Uh, and we want these rights to extend to the new arrivals and immigrants so that they too will have the protection of the law. Mm. Now, while I agree with Elzer that uh, it's a very stormy time these days because of the COVID, because of the economic distress that was imposed by the lockdowns, mm. uh, these, these situations stress any society. Uh, you can see the stress is not just the United States, but you see it in Europe as well. Uh, and in Latin America. Every society has got racial stereotypes. And I think we in the United States should be careful to grab at stereotypical and racial answers as the mm -hmm. first source of, uh, of, of, of recourse. I see. We should look at the stresses that that's in the, uh, the, the COVID and lockdowns. Mm. <laughs> Professor Tong, of course, you're outside the United States, but you're teaching American studies to your students in China. Looking what is going on, what is your takeaway, in fact, when you're watching what is going on, at least in the news, because we can't travel to the U.S. for now? It's confusion. It's um, frustration. And it's, I mean, and it's, it's always my sympathy towards those who are now being victimized by this current um, a new spurt of this very, a new surge of this very um, 
sort of violence and crimes against uh, certain uh, minority groups. What is the solution? What about law enforcement, uh, Mr. Lee? Where are they? I think it's going against hate crimes is the wrong thing. It's going against crime should be the effort. Going against violent crime should be where the, the force of policy should be. So, so right now, uh, enforcing the law and making sure that there's absolute punishment. You don't, you don't just catch someone and let them go mm -hmm. the way so many cities have done. Criminals should be put in jail and punished for it. And, and that enforcement just isn't there right now. Mm. Professor Felzer. My view, which is um, somewhat different from, from Mr. Lee's, is to really look at some of the immediate pressures, the stresses that he refers to as what's causing this. Mm -hmm. And I think that the issue of immigration has been very um, vitriolic and full of hate, and it got worse in the past few years. In my view, the mockery of people who were um, of minority populations, Asians, African Americans, has extended, closing the border, the terrible situation at detention centers. Many groups get targeted all at once. There's right. a lot of anti-Semitism mm -hmm. happening, anti-Asian, mm -hmm. anti-Chinese, and you know, and enduringly anti-Latino and anti-Black that's happened in this country. I think with all of these groups, it's important to particularize what are the particular histories in the present and what are the traditions of hatred and disenfranchisement, mm -hmm. exploitation that have happened to different groups. So I think that I am not, um, I, I don't think that the issue of defunding the police has actually been implemented and I don't think that that's why people picked up a gun and went in and murdered six Asian women. I see. New York City. Uh, in fact, New York City is a prime example of that, where Astoria, everyone, you know, there's hardly a policeman on the street. Uh, and they have to resort to vigilante groups to protect the elderly. So I think, I think you're, 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 the, the funding of police is, is an issue. But, but just being an immigrant doesn't make me a victim. I, just uh, the, the guy who shot these poor women in Atlanta, he was not an immigrant. He wasn't going after immigrants. He was going after someone who bothered him. And it just so happens that he shot, picked on a whole bunch of Asian women. So, so I, think, I think we shouldn't take these, isol these particular cases and, and, and generalize them. Professor Belzer, you want to uh, you know, articulate a little bit more about what you just said? I think the police are in fact very well funded and that there is a, a, a collaboration between the military and the police, for example, of providing police departments with a lot of military equipment and military arms that are either slightly out of date or were over-purchased or were purchased in the name of supporting the military that have gone to um, gone into police departments. I think that the there is a long history of targeting Asians in this country. The Chinese people were the first migrants um, attacked when they came for the gold rush in 1849 and California passed the foreign miners tax, which was targeted uh, initially on the Chileans, but the Chileans sent a boat and took their people back. Mm -hmm. And so it really mm -hmm. landed on the Chinese people who paid half the budget in during the originating years of California to keep California going with the foreign miners tax. But I think it's important that we add into tonight's conversation this notion of victimization because mm -hmm. The history of Asian Americans in this country is extremely formidable, very courageous. The Chinese filed the first lawsuits for reparations in the United States, and they won half a million dollars. They um, aggregated it, and they won half a million dollars under the Belmont Act. They organized the first general strike. So I don't find in the Asian community, 
a sort of passiveness. I think the danger and what happened to the women is um, not because Asian people are docile or passive, but they've been targeted mm. as vulnerable. Mm. And in fact, it's a very sturdy, powerful, vocal, culturally rich, very popular and very trendy um, group of people right now. Uh, Professor Tong, since you are here in China, just as I am, I haven't been to the U.S. for, almost, for, for more than a year already because of the uh, COVID-19. So, Professor Tong, what are your concerns when you are watching the stories, when you are hearing the debates between our distinguished guests, uh, Mr. Lee and uh, Professor Felzer, what are you thinking about? Well, uh, Gary, I've been traveling to the States almost every year prior to the pandemic broke out. My feeling is, or my concern is that um, uh, perhaps people need protection. People need uh, the kind of institutional perfection that the, the, the protection provides, uh, provided by the government per se, or by the law enforcement. Currently, I see this group called the Compassion in Oakland. I mean, this is a mixed group of African Americans, Chinese Americans, Japanese Americans, Korean Americans. They walk side by side on the street. Okay. Um, it's 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 a good thing to see, but then it's also a sad thing to see. I mean, the citizens of one country have to rely themselves on compassion to protect themselves. Mm. This is not happening in China. I mean, this is not happening in China. I don't see this in uh, happening in China. I mean, our education is that every one, each and every one of us should be well protected by the government, by the law enforcement. At the Biden administration, you know, at the uh, federal level, there has been a lot of talk about protection of human rights and uh, uh, racial equity. But at the same time, things like this are happening and there seems to be not necessarily a very efficient way of stopping it. So. Uh, there are two conclusions people could possibly reach. One is preaching is one thing, doing is another. The other is the, this administration and the government apparatus are incapable of implementing the ideas. So which one is this? Or you have other explanations. If things are like this, what does it mean for the Asian and Pacific Island community? Well, I think let's remember that President Biden has only been in office for two months. That's true. It's a very divided Senate and a very divided Congress. And it's going to be, he has made many initiatives, many, many initiatives all at once. And we'll have to see how these are going to be implemented on the federal level. And then to look towards what's happening at the states. Mm. I think if we mm. look to the 60s and talk about the Black Panthers, I think we're, really going backwards in time and mm. that we know from Black Lives Matter and the brutality against African American people by the police mm. that none of these populations of people are well protected or are safe and what's happening is that each of these groups sometimes in coalition with each other when things work well are having to figure out what what their specific needs are yeah for african americans there are dire economic situations in terms of education in terms of school in terms of health care and i think in immigrant populations and i think also and i speak with great respect but there are, to even pool all asian Americans into one group of people mm. falls into a very dangerous trap and it almost falls into visibility. Um, we don't want to get into a stereotype of talking about all Asians or all blacks or all women or all anything. I think once you put the all in front of it, mm. we're really in trouble. Mm. And I think it's important to look at particular groups of people, what their legal status is, whether they're documented or undocumented. If you're not documented, you're not going to go to the police. 
You're not going to go to the lawyer. You're not going to even enroll your kids in school. Mm -hmm. You're not going to take your kid to the emergency room. And if somebody's coming after you, you know, you don't have the legal resources to defend yourself. So in my view, a lot of this starts with economics, but it starts also with immigration policies. And we may not agree on what the most protective or ideal or just immigration policy is. I'm a daughter of immigrants. Um, had there been differences at the time on both sides of my family, I would be an undocumented person. And without papers, you're totally vulnerable. If we're talking about what we do right, right now, then we look at immigration policy and we look at gun laws. And those would probably be, you know, the most urgent. And then we look at anti-trafficking legislation. The Republicans in Congress just voted against, although it passed, they voted against the Violence Against Women Act. So this is why I'm calling it a perfect storm of contempt for Asians, for women, for poor people, for undocumented people. And all of those things we can address very quickly. Mr. Lee. Just as uh, the talk field's uh, observations of the United States was very poignant, we need cops on the street. That means neighborhood local police knowing the people there and being able to integrate themselves to know and, and, and enforcing the law as it should be on a street by street, neighborhood by neighborhood level. So it's local enforcement, local police that we're talking about funding here. And they are being truly defunded in so many cities. Uh, so, so Professor Tung also said that to protect people, uh, they have to have rights. And, and the rights have to extend beyond being a citizen, but also being a resident and residents' rights are also being protected by local police. So to me, the heart of the matter is to have the institutions enforced and to get rid of the trend that we have now in district attorneys not enforcing laws, in, in catching criminals and letting them go. Uh, that's sort of procedure that breeds even more violence and more crime because crime goes unpunished. Mm. Professor Tong? Absolutely, um, absolutely. I think that um, uh, in in a country known for, I mean, proud of being ruled by law, rule of law. I mean, um, we need. Uh, uh, what I'm expect, expecting to see is that law enforcement. I mean, basically, boots on the ground in neighborhoods. And um, I, I, uh, I won't go back to China. But then, if I may, I mean, see in China. In terms of crime and, and, and cracking down on crimes, we also have what we call the Jim I mean, the committee in the neighborhood. I mean, this committee in the neighborhood is extremely useful in identify the very crime and the very person and also perhaps this very uh, potential crimes to be committed and, 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 and then set up this very alarm system in close connection and close cooperation with the local police. And so in this case, um, I'm equally opposing to the idea that Asian Americans are particularly singled out as a target. Uh, uh, generally speaking, I mean, crime-wise, I mean, uh, it should be cracked down, it should be cracked down by all means possible. And in this case, I think the U.S. is some kind of um, lagging behind in addressing this very issue. I mean, I know there are issues. I mean, the man who killed women has issues with his family, with his, with his history of uh, domestic abuse, uh, by domestic violence. But then um, isn't there a way that we actually set up this very local uh, and community level uh, committee or uh, self-organized um, group to protect the neighborhood, to patrol the neighborhood, okay. if there is a shortage of funding on the part of police enforcement. Mm. They used to be called block associations. People oh, yeah. in the neighborhood watching out for everybody else and being in, right. in touch with local police who come immediately when called. Right now in Los Angeles, if you call the police and they say, if it's just someone loitering, we're not coming. If it's just someone breaking into your car, we're not coming because that's not considered a serious crime. Okay. Professor I think Felder. it's important to add, though, that the United States has more people incarcerated 
probably than any other country in the world. And if we look at the whole chain from the moment of crime and also what's defined as a crime up through the number of people who are incarcerated in the United States, the number transcends figures in any other country and any other developed country in mm -hmm. the world. So mm -hmm. I don't think the issue is that we have um, inactive police force. And we are in a moment of transition where certain, for example, low level drug, drug crimes are, and especially with COVID, it's been a very odd time in the United States watching the prison population be paroled because they, because of COVID. Mm -hmm. And in California, we had a situation where the prisoners were the firefighters and there were not enough people in California to fight the fires this summer because so many people were being paroled. If we're talking about what is happening to Asian people, I think that the issue of community policing is really important. It's not the direction that many police forces are going in. They're going into much more high tech or sur surveillance, computer forensics, drones. And uh -huh. we saw in uh -huh. Washington, D.C., the level of tanks. There was no way they were going to start shooting tanks in Washington, D.C. It was a sort of meaningless police presence that didn't give anybody a sense of access to a neighborhood police officer, familiarity, contact. I think that community policing is intimate, it's right. friendly, it, it's on trust, but we're, we have many more systemic problems that will come with that change in philosophy. I don't know if we'll ever get that back. And, and the other thing I, I, I find from every one of you is that uh, it, it seems that the reasons are all around, and therefore uh, we have to address them all around. But where is the starting point? That is the most important thing. We have to begin to act today. So what should we act on? Um, it's not just about one administration, because we see racial discrimination through various administrations, just some under you know, much uh, dramatic circumstances like today, this COVID-19, right? So. Uh, I, I really wonder, it is not an administration thing, so what is it? What is the systematic solutions to it? Have, has America been debated about this and doing things after the debate? Uh, Professor Felser, maybe I go to you first and then I go to everybody. There are minorities in all of our countries, yes. across yes. Europe, across Asia. There are minority populations and each has a very different history. And so I'm very leery of making generalizations, but the issues that I think would address the anti-Asian crime right now is one is for visibility of powerful Asian Americans in, the, in this administration. And that began to get surfaced this week and who the cabinet appointments were, why there were no Asians in this cabinet and that that's being addressed. Um, and I think the tragedies and the violence has put a pressure point on President Biden to diversify and in include Asian Americans at the highest level. And then I think the issue of immigration is serious okay. and desperate. Okay. And it's, so I would say guns, immigration, voting rights, so that people feel that they have access. They need access to more than the cop on the street. They need access to medical care, to the whole judicial system, to the education system. And so all of these have to come together in a, in a, a melange in, so that things get addressed at once. We okay. won't fix it by prioritizing one. Okay, Mr. Lee. I think the discussion of systematic racism and, and a systematic discussion has to get rid of the term systematic racism. We can't pull together everything because then we get nothing. We have to have priorities and the priority here is to make the institutions work and, and to address the source of the distress, not the symptoms of the distress. Yes, Asians are victimized now, 
but Asians were victimized in the 70s when the unemployed auto workers were thrown out of work by the Japanese. Uh, and the Germans were distressed in the 20s during World War I and World War II. So, so the systematic racism is tribalism, in other words. And to get rid of the stress is to open up the economy, get people back to work, have the unemployment rate down at 3.5%, and, okay. and have everyone have enough so you don't have to go after someone else's property. All right. That is really the source of the solution. Professor Tong, your final words. Also, yeah, same I mean, question. The, to, me, the, to me, actually, the economic factors play a key role. I mean, I remember back in the, the late 1990s, uh, I, can, I could travel back on the subway in New York City around 3 o'clock in the morning because it was the best time in terms of the nation's economy with this boom in the Internet sector. And so everyone has their, um, uh, this, has their pocket full at that very time. And so I, don't, I didn't experience any crime whatsoever in New York City. That's New York, that was New York City almost like 20 years ago. One uh, particular system I think that I, I, I can think of right now is the role of community leaders. Community leaders should stand out at this very point. To me, American society is still a society that's lacking in this very racial integration and also political kind of a persuasion okay. based on this very um, integration. So um, once again, I think um, a systematic problem is a system to address and okay. uh, individuals play a key role. All right. Teng Ji Meng, Willem Lee and Jean Felser, thank you so much for your insight.